Well, good morning, good morning. Well, we want to encourage all of the men who are here to consider joining us. Pastor Manley will be there, I'll be there, other pastors from other campuses for our men's I Want Victory Retreat on Friday night, February the 27th, and Saturday morning, February 28th. We're going to have real food. Everybody say real food. Lots of fun. People, men will be experiencing the freedom of the Lord and the power of the Lord. And it's a place for real men to come to. How many real men do we have here? Let me see. Let me make check. Real men. Put a hand up, Leo, there. All right, there. We want to encourage all of you men to come. It's a great time. Uh, if you would li- be interested in learning more about the men's I Want Victory Retreat, just write Victory on your communication card. We'll get back with you and get to you the information uh, that you need for that retreat. Well, I'm delighted to be here with you today. Actually, I'm coming back off of a week on vacation while Pastor Manley is going on vacation. Uh, We have uh, one of the top evangelists in the nation, Scott Camp, is at our Metairie Campus Day, and so I was free, and so Pastor Manley asked if I'd preach here at our Kenner congregation, and and I'm so glad to be here. I want to tell you how proud I am of what God, you're allowing the Lord to do through you. I'm so proud of Pastor Manley and Pastor Javier and the others, but you being faithful here, coming here and helping start this new work in Kenner, reaching the St. Charles Parish, and, and God is using you in a great and mighty way. So give yourself a hand because you deserve it. Thank you for being a part of this great work that God is doing here. And all of our campuses, we're experiencing phenomenal growth at our elementary campus. In fact, uh, we have grown by 500 people in the last six months since you guys moved over. So we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have the room for them if you hadn't made this decision. Thank you for doing that and for helping us as we continue to reach out to the greater New Orleans area. If you have your Bible or your smartphone, I want you to take it today and turn to me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. There's a study guide inside your program that you can utilize to follow along with today's message. I just told you my wife and I just got back from vacation. We, uh, we actually were on a cruise in the Southern Caribbean, hitting all those islands in the Southern Caribbean. We wound up in, on the island of St. Thomas. I didn't know. Did you know that St. Thomas is a U.S. territory? Did you know that? Now, because it's a U.S. territory, the people there can't vote for the president. And so they said to us, you guys be sure and vote well because we're stuck with whomever you elect up there, all right? But one of the guys I met there said to me, he said, one day, it's my dream, go to Washington, D.C. to see all the museums and the Capitol building and the White House and all that. It reminded me of a story of another man who said to his barber, he was getting his hair cut, he said, I'm going to go soon on a vacation to Washington, D.C. I've always wanted to see the museums, I always wanted to see the city, the Capitol building, and the White House. And the barber was the barber was kind of negative and critical. How many of you know any negative and critical people? Let me see your hand. Don't look to the left or right. Just look at me right now. All right, negative and critical people. The barber said, I wouldn't do that if I were you. I've heard that the flights are terrible. You can't get a direct flight from New Orleans to D.C. I've heard that when you get there, you'll never be able to find a taxi cab. I've also heard that you may get to see the, the White House, but the crowds will be so big, you'll never get to see the president. Just negative negative, negative. Well, a month later, the man was back getting his hair cut. He said to the barber, he said, I want to tell you, I took that trip to Washington, D.C. It's the best vacation I've ever had. He said the flight was a direct flight from New Orleans to there. He said when I got there, there was a taxi cab waiting for me like someone had sent the taxi cab for me. He said and when I got to the White House after making all the other rounds, uh, there were large crowds there, but the president sent one of his own security guys to get me, and I had a personal interview, a personal meeting with the president of the United States of America. Well, the barber was astounded. He said, why in the world would the president want to meet with you? And the man said, I wondered myself. But the president said, I just had to meet you because that's the worst looking haircut I've ever seen in all of my life. (laughs) Tell the person beside you, don't be like that barber. Go ahead and tell them that right now. Today we want to learn not how to be discouraging like that barber was, but how to live an encouraging life as we close out this Live the Truth series we've been studying In Philippians chapter 1 and 2. Here's what we find in Philippians chapter 2. Verses 19 and following. If the Lord Jesus is willing. I hope to send Timothy to you soon for a visit. Then he can cheer me up. By telling me how you are getting along. I have no one else like Timothy. Don't you wish people could say that about you. I have no one else like Timothy. Who genuinely cares about your welfare. All the others care only for themselves. And not for what matters to Jesus Christ. But you know how Timothy has proved himself. Like a son with his father, he has served with me in preaching the good news. I hope to send him 
to you just as soon as I find out what is going to happen to me here. Paul was in prison in Rome, and that's why he was then in Timothy. And I have confidence from the Lord that I myself will come to see you soon. Meanwhile, I thought I should send Epaphroditus back to you. He is a true brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier. And he was your messenger to help me in my need. I'm sending him because he has been longing to see you. And he was very distressed that you heard that he was ill. And he certainly was ill. In fact, he almost died. But God had mercy on him. And also on me so that I would not have one sorrow after another. So I am all the more anxious to send him back to you, for I know you will be glad to see him, and then I will not be so worried about you. Welcome him in the Lord's love and with great joy, and give him the honor that people like him deserve, for he risked his life for the work of Christ. He was at the point of death while doing for me what you couldn't do from far away. Now, I've come to tell you today, on behalf of all of our Celebration congregations, God's doing a great work through Celebration Church. And what He's doing here through this Kenner congregation is a part of the great work that God is doing. Uh, for some time in this Live the Truth series, we've been learning about the Apostle Paul. You know, Paul, who was originally known as Saul of Tarsus, he had once been one of the great leaders of the Jewish faith in his day. But he had a supernatural encounter with Jesus Christ. How many of you ever had a life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ? Paul had a supernatural encounter with Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road that transformed his life. And he became a Christian, but not just a Christian. Paul became a great, great Christian. He became the acknowledged leader of the Christian church in the first century. He became the catalyst for carrying the message and ministry of Jesus to other countries and other cultures. Uh, uh, Paul was one who began to write it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And a third of the New Testament are actually letters written to the churches of the first century that were written by the apostle Paul himself. I'm telling you, Paul was a great Christian. Nobody outside of Jesus Christ has ever impacted the Christian faith. He was soup, Mr. Super Christian. But the truth the matter is not all of us are super Christians most of us are super Christians in fact I'm not sure if there's a single super Christian Dennis Watson included in this room today but the good news is God doesn't primarily work in and through the lives of super Christians but he utilizes ordinary people like you and I to accomplish his extraordinary work can somebody say praise the Lord right there Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Remember that few of you are wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think that they are wise. Here's what that verse tells God uses people who have problems. How many of you ever had problems in your life? I tell people everybody either has a problem, is a problem, or lives with a problem. How many of you have problems in your life? Go and tell the truth, right? God uses people who have problems. God uses people who have issues. God uses people who failed in some realm of life. As Pastor Manny would say, God uses people from jacked up families and all kinds of things. God can use even you, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how, no matter how many times you messed up in life. God can use every single one of us to accomplish extraordinary things in our world. And we learn about that today. From the passage we just read, particularly as Paul talks to us about his two friends, Timothy and Epaphroditus. I want you to write several things down, two major things down in that study guide that will help you today and in the days to come. As we answer this question, what qualities does the Lord particularly utilize when he works through people to encourage and help others? To begin with, we discover that the Lord uses caring people to accomplish his work. He uses caring people to accomplish his work. He begins with these words about a man named Timothy. He said, I hope to send Timothy to you soon for a visit. Then he can cheer me up by telling me how you're getting along. I have no one else like Timothy who genuinely cares about your welfare. Now you may be wondering, who is this guy Timothy that Paul was referring to? 
On Acts 16.1, we discover that Timothy was actually a native of Lystra or Derby, which were cities in southern Asia in the area we now know of as Turkey. Timothy was a child of a mixed marriage. His mother Eunice was a Jew, but his father was a Greek, and we don't, we're never told his father's name. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, we're told that Timothy's mother and his grandmother Lois came to faith in Jesus Christ. And they had such a fervent faith in the Lord that they eventually led Timothy, while he was still a child, to come to know the Lord. In Acts 16, verses 2 through 4, we learn that Timothy joined Paul on his second missionary journey. He became a, a mentee of Paul, a disciple of Paul, a protege of Paul, and he learned much from Paul about missionary, about ministry and missions. And then history tells us that Timothy went on to become, he went on to become the pastor of a church in the city of Ephesus, and later on, he became the bishop of the churches in that surrounding area. In fact, uh, Timothy was so close to Paul that Paul referred to Timothy as a son in the Lord. Uh, you know, Pastor Manley and, and uh, Pastor Patrick Egan at our St. Bernard campus, even young guys like Javier Costa, and they came to faith in Christ in our church. They grew up in our church. Uh, uh, we spent so much time together. They're, we talked about this not long ago. They're like sons in the Lord to me. And it's exciting to see what God does in somebody's life. And Paul was excited about what God was doing in Timothy's life. One of the things I love about Timothy's story is that Timothy came to faith in Jesus Christ when he was young. How many of you came to faith in Jesus before you were 15 years of age? Let me see your hands. Some of you did before you were 15 years of age. In fact, I, the statistics tell us that the most crucial time for people to hear about the Lord or while they're children or in their early teens, most people come to faith in Christ during those years. Now, I want to tell you, those of you who are parents today, and even those of you who are grandparents, you need to do everything you can to lead your children to faith in Christ while they are still young. I'll tell you why. Because one day, you won't be able to be there for them. One day, you won't be able to protect them. One day, you won't be able to provide for them. One day, you won't be there to help them. But if they know the Lord, they can pray and access the power and the provision and the peace and the help of the Lord for their life. We need to do what Timothy's mother and grandmother did and lead our children to faith in Christ while they are young. Now, you're probably thinking if Timothy came to faith in Christ while he was young, he probably never had any problem. But that's where you would be wrong. We're told in the Bible at one time, Timothy struggled with fear in his life. Have you ever struggled with fear? Fear is probably the most predominant negative emotion that people struggle with in our day and time. People fear losing their health and they fear losing their wealth. They fear losing their sanity and they fear losing their salvation. They, they fear losing their friends and their family members. They fear losing their job. They, they fear what society holds. They fear what the future holds. They fear all kinds of things. In life. And, and we're told that Timothy, even though he was a young man of God, even though he was a protege of Paul, he sometimes struggled with fear. He also had a sense of failure. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, Paul admonished him for not being a stronger preacher of the gospel, for not being a, a more fervent witness of the faith. Now, if, if that was the sole criteria for failure or for success, many Christians here would be struggling with a sense of failure. But Paul really challenged Timothy about that. And then Timothy struggled with physical frailty or illness from time to time. In fact, we're told in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, that Timothy had some stomach problems. Anybody ever had any stomach problems? And so Paul told Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach's sake. Now, not a lot of wine like we're accustomed to here in New Orleans, all right? Not a lot of beer, not a lot of alcohol, but a little wine for his stomach problems. I remember when I was a teenager, a young teenager, my older cousins took me out and got me wine drunk. I'm not bragging on that. I'm telling that before I came to faith. Have you ever, have anybody ever, don't, don't raise your hand, all right? Man, I was so sick. I remember walking in the door of my, my parents' house about midnight, and I walked into this wall and that wall. I walked into a door frame. I mean, I, I had a bruise on my head. I was so sick. And my dad was just there, just watching me walk in there. And he told me, son, you're going to learn. You're going to learn. Uh, and I didn't learn soon enough, but uh, uh, he said, go to bed. And well, the next morning, he got me up early to go to work with. And I, I went out there. He put me working beside a truck, and the exhaust was, man, I got so sick. I'm telling you, I, I, I hadn't been that sick since, uh, since that time. I got so sick. And so my dad, you know how dads sometimes cover up from their sons? He said, go home and tell your mama that you are sick. You have an upset stomach. Now, my mama believed that a little wine would cure any upset stomach. 
And so when I got home, I said, Mama, my stomach's messed up. She said, let me go get the blackberry wine. I said, no, Mama, no, Mama, no, Mama, no, Mama. I don't think I've had wine since that time, you know. Paul said to Timothy, take a little wine. Help out your stomach. Here's what I'm saying. That although Timothy came to faith in Christ as a young man, and although he was a protege and a disciple and a mentee of Paul, he still had his struggles. He still had his issues. Tell the person beside you, God can use you. Go ahead and tell them that again. God can use you. Uh, but he was used. He became a significant leader in God's work. Now, several things about Timothy that made him such a significant leader for the Lord. First of all, to be used by God, we must care about the personal welfare of others. The personal welfare of others. Paul said about Timothy, Timothy genuinely cares about your welfare. All the others only care for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. Timothy really cared about other people. Let me ask you a question. Can that be said about you? Can that, can that be genuinely said about you that you care about the welfare of others? Or can it be more accurately said is that you really only care about yourself or your immediate family members? One man prayed like this one time, Lord bless me and my wife, our son and his wife, us four and no more. And sometimes that's how people pray because they only care about themselves and those closest to us. The Bible says we need to become like Timothy. We need to care about others, have a genuine kind of care for others. In fact, let me ask you this question. Why do so many people in our day seemingly have little or no concern or compassion for others? There are probably lots of answers to that question. One reason is because it could be because they're self-centered or they're self-focused. And we talked about that in recent weeks. And another some reason is because some people have little or no concern for others is because they've been hurt by others and they've retreated and they've made themselves invulnerable. But whatever the reason, here's what I want you to know. God wants us. To be like Timothy. He wants us to take care for others. He wants us to be concerned about others. In fact, he tells us that he, we've been called by him to attend to the physical and emotional needs of others. One day we're going to stand before the Lord up in heaven. For some people that's an exciting thought. For others that's a fearful thought. When we stand before the Lord in heaven, we're going to be judged. We're not going to be judged, by the way, by how much Bible knowledge we've accrued. We're not going to be judged uh, whether or not we were in church every Sunday or whatever like that. Here, here's what the Bible says. Jesus said, the king will say to those on the right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. And Jesus went on to say that those who were listening to the king will say, Lord, when do we do all those things for you? And the Lord will say, when you've done it unto any other person, it's like you've done it for me. Now listen, at the end of time, we'll be rewarded by whether or not we've been like Timothy, we've really cared for others and demonstrated our care for others. So ask yourself this question, who are some people that are hurting physically or emotionally or financially or relationally that I need to encourage or assist or help in the future. Who are some people that come to your mind? You may be thinking of the elderly. You may be thinking of other single adults. My, my wife has a ministry on Saturday nights at Metairie Campus for single moms, and that's a great need. You, you may be thinking of people who, who struggle with addictions like you once did, or you may be thinking of couples in crisis. But I'm telling you, there are people out in the world today who have struggles and issues, and, and God expects you to care for them, and, and not just to say that you care for them, but to do something to show that you care for them. Susan Matisse was a woman who lived in Utah, and the, the, the two uh, individuals, I'm going to say, that she cared the most for were her dogs. She had two big dogs that she really loved. How many of you love dogs? Let me see your hands. And how many of you are confident that your dogs love you as much as you love them? Let me see your hand. You really are that confident, right? Susan Matisse heard that you can actually tell how much your dogs care for you by watching how they respond when something critical happens to you. So one day she decided to give her dogs a test. She was sitting in front of the television and in the living room. She, had, she was eating some pizza. Her dogs were there in the room. And, uh, and she, all of a sudden, she grabbed her chest like she was having a heart attack. And she fell over on the floor uh, like something catastrophic had happened to her. And, and her eyes were closed, but through her eyelashes, she watched her dog to see what they would do, to see how much they really cared about her. The dogs looked at her. They looked at one another. And then both of them made a dash for the pizza. Tell the person beside you, don't be like those dogs. Go ahead and tell them that. 
Don't be like those dogs. We must be loving and caring and concerned about others. We must be like Timothy, concerned about the personal welfare of others. Now, to be used by God, we must be concerned about the personal welfare of others. We also must be concerned about the spiritual welfare of others. Look at what Paul wrote about Timothy in the next verse of our text. He says, you know how Timothy has proved himself like a son with his father. He has served with me in preaching the good news. Now remember I said earlier there was a time in Timothy's life when he was fearful to tell others about Jesus. Paul admonished him. Paul challenged him in the letter called 2 Timothy. But we can see from our text that because with Paul's encouragement and with the Holy Spirit's enablement, Timothy had become better in proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ to others. And I'm telling you today, we need to become like Timothy. We need to care enough about people to tell them how they can experience the Lord's forgiveness and the Lord's freedom and the Lord's fulfillment and the future of heaven in their lives. Paul once wrote these words to the Christians who were in Ephesus. Look at this verse, uh, Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 13 on your study guide. I want you to underline some statements in that big passage of Scripture. Paul said, you Gentiles used to be outsiders. That's where we all used to be, outside the kingdom of God. In those days, he said, you were living apart from Christ. Underline that phrase, you were living apart from Christ. He said, and you were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. Underline that phrase, excluded from citizenship. He said, you did not know the covenant promises that God had made to them. Underline that phrase, you didn't know the covenant promises. He said, you lived in this world without God. Underline those two words, without God, and without hope. Underline those two words without hope. But now, he said, you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, here's what Paul was saying. Before you came to faith in Christ, no matter how good you were, no matter how moral you were, no matter what a good citizen you were, here's what he said. You were Christless. You were churchless. You were promiseless. You were godless. You were hopeless. And that is the condition of every person before they come to faith in Jesus Christ. That's the condition of your closest friends who don't know the Lord. That's the condition of your family members, the ones you like and the ones you don't like before they come to know the Lord. That's the condition of the people you work with before they come to know the Lord. They are Christless and churchless and promiseless and godless and hopeless. And if you really care about them, you'll be bold enough and brave enough to share with them about who the Lord is to you and what the Lord has done for you. Amen? We show that we care about people's spiritual, spiritual welfare when we pray for their salvation. When we share our faith or our testimony with them. When we invite them to life group gatherings or to worship services. And all those kinds of things. We're showing them we really, really care about what's most important in their life. I told you, Vicky and I, we took a cruise to the Southern Caribbean and we visited the islands of Barbados and uh, Antigua and St. Lucia and St. Martin and St. Thomas. And, and, and you know, the, most of the people on those islands, uh, most of the residents on the islands, are descendants of slaves that were brought over many years ago from Africa. Now, those slaves who came over from Africa to those islands, they had all kind of pagan religions. None of it was Christian. All kind of pagan backgrounds and religions. There was a group of Christians called the Moravian Brethren who got a real burden for the spiritual condition of those slaves there in, in those islands. And so you know what they did? They sold themselves into slavery. These Moravian Brethren sold themselves into slavery so they could work alongside these slaves. So they could tell them about who Jesus was to them and what Jesus had done for them. And today, most of the people in those islands are followers of Jesus Christ. But it was because somebody cared enough about them to go the extra mile to share the gospel with them. Now, you and I are probably not going to have to sell ourselves into slavery. Somebody say, thank God. But if we really love people like we say we love people, we're going to do everything we can put their hand in the hand of the Savior. Amen? Amen? Tell the person beside you, let's be like Timothy. Go ahead and tell them that right now. Let's care about the personal welfare of others. Let's care about the spiritual welfare of others. We discover from our text that the Lord uses caring people to accomplish extraordinary things. Here's the second thing. We discover from our text that the Lord uses committed people to accomplish His work. He writes about a, a guy named Epaphroditus in verse 25. He says, I thought I should send Epaphroditus back to you. He is a true brother, a co-worker, and a fellow 
soldier. How many of you are glad that your mama didn't name you Epaphroditus? Let me see your hand. You might want to try pronouncing that to somebody around you before you leave today. Now we can tell from our passage in Philippians 2 that Epaphroditus was a friend of Paul. Now Paul had lots of friends in the different churches that he established. In Rome, in Romans chapter 16, he, he named 35 friends that he had in the church in Rome. In the church in Philippi that he wrote this letter to, Paul had friends there. He had the wealthy woman Lydia he had started the church with. She was his friend. He was friends with a jailer. Remember, Paul was miraculously set, for, miraculously set free from prison by the hand of the Lord. He led the jailer and the jailer's family to faith in Christ. But another friend Paul had was this man named Epaphroditus. Now, some names, especially names in the first century, had particular meanings, even today. Sometimes you can tell what a person does or how a person is by their name. There was a guy actually named Joe Bunt. You know what he was? He was a baseball coach. Can you believe that? Joe Bunt. There was a guy named uh, Dan Druff. He was a barber. Uh, there was a guy named Jeff Treadwell. He was a podiatrist. There was a guy named Will Crumble. He was a drywall contractor. You wouldn't want to hire Will Crumble right there. And there was another guy. His name was Will Drup. And he was a window washer up on the skyscrapers. Now, I don't know about you, but if my name was Will Drop, I think I'd find me some other profession, don't you? Sometimes names have meaning. The name Epaphroditus actually meant lovely or charming. The name probably described his demeanor rather than his appearance because we find he was a tough dude and a hearty man and all that kind of stuff. But there was something about Epaphroditus that made him a charming and winsome person. And, and, but, he, but more than all that, he was a committed person. Now, several things we notice and we learn from his life. First of all, committed Christians are willing to be servants of others. In Philippians 2.25, Paul described Epaphroditus as a co-worker in the Lord. That meant that Epaphroditus, like Paul, uh, was a servant of God and a servant of others. Let me ask you a question. Can you be described as a servant of God and a servant of others. Early in Philippians, we discover that all Christians have been called by the Lord, commissioned by the Lord, commanded by the Lord to serve God by serving others. In fact, Peter wrote about that. He wrote in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to make a lot of money. Is that what the Bible says? Or each of you should use whatever gift you've received to take care of yourself. Is that what the Bible says? Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to do what? To serve others. We've all been called and commanded by the Lord to serve others. Now, notice several things. One, real servants are always available to help others. You learn that from the life of Jesus. One day, Jesus was walking down the street. And two blind men began to shout at him. They shouted, Lord, have mercy on us. And the Bible says Jesus stopped and he called out to them, what do you want me to do for you? Now, circle that phrase there, Jesus stopped. A lot of people like to study the steps of Jesus, but let me tell you, if you want to find out where ministry is really happening, study the stops of Jesus, and here's what you'll find. Jesus was continually stopping to help other people. He was willing to be interrupted. Now, how many of you like being interrupted? Let me see your hands. I was going to call you a liar if you lift your hand right there. We hate interruptions. Let me tell you, if you're going to be a servant of God, you're going to have to see interruptions as ministry opportunities to help other people and serve the Lord. Now, real servants of the Lord are always available to help others, and they're faithful in helping others. It says in 1 Corinthians 4, 2, the one thing required of servants is that they, they are faithful. Now, we don't know what Epaphroditus did in the church of Philippi. We don't know if he was an elder or a deacon or life group leader. We don't know if he was a greeter or an usher, if he worked in the children's ministry. We don't know anything about him, but we know he was faithful in serving the Lord. And let me tell you something. We need lots more people like Epaphroditus in the church of Jesus Christ. We also learned that committed Christians are willing to be soldiers for the Lord. In a previous verse we read, Paul referred to Epaphroditus as a fellow soldier in the Lord's army. And then he wrote these words in verse 29 and 30. Welcome Epaphroditus in the Lord's love and with great joy and give him the honor that people like him deserve. For he risked his life for the work of Christ and he was at the point of death while doing for me what you couldn't do from far away. In those verses, Paul says Epaphroditus was a real soldier in the army of the Lord. Now, what does it take to become a real soldier? Number one, real soldiers are willing to push past their fears. It doesn't mean that they don't have any fears. They're willing to push past their fears. We mentioned earlier that people struggle with all 
kinds of fears in life. Over 700 different phobias are mentioned in the dictionary. Uh, some people have the fear of acrophobia, which is the fear of high places. I have a picture, I think, of somebody working up way up high. I think, man, I couldn't do that job, you know, way up high there. Some people have a, the fear of claust uh, called claustrophobia, the fear of tight, enclosed places. Some people have the fear uh, called ergophobia. The fear of work. I know lots of people have that kind of fear. Some people have ecclesiophobia, which is the fear of going to church. How many of you know somebody has that kind of fear in their life right there? Now, Vicky was in the first service and she's not here. I say, some people have something called magirococophobia, which is the fear of cooking. Sometimes I think she has that kind of fear right there. I was getting on an airplane, actually getting off the airplane. A lady was telling me. She says, you know, sir, I have a fear of flying. I said, not me. I don't have a fear of flying. I have a fear of crashing. That's what I have, you know. I can do all the flying, but I don't want to be crashing. Now, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to die like that. You know what I'm talking about, Kevin, right there? I don't know what kind of fears Epaphroditus may have struggled with. But he didn't let any type of fear keep him from serving the Lord or being a soldier for the Lord. And we shouldn't let fears keep us down or keep us back either. And Joyce Myers used to say, Sometimes you got to do it afraid. The Bible says this, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. How many of you know when the Lord's on your side, you don't have to be afraid any longer? Real soldiers of the Lord are willing to push past their fears. And real soldiers of the Lord are willing to push past their fatigue. Paul wrote that Epaphroditus was at the point of death, even as he was trying to assist and help him out. That probably meant that Epaphroditus was really sick for a period of time, but he didn't allow his frailty, he didn't allow his fatigue to keep him from pressing forward. If we're going to be good soldiers in the Lord's army, we can't let our problems, we can't let our, our difficulties, we can't let our trials or our challenges keep us from being who God's called us to be or keep us from doing who God's called us to do. I think about this man, Epaphroditus. You probably never even heard his name before today. I think, man, we need a lot more people like that in the church of the 21st century. Amen? Amen. We need people like Epaphroditus. He wasn't a pastor like Timothy. He wasn't a super Christian like Paul. But, but he, was, he was passionately willing to serve the Lord and be a soldier, not a general in the Lord's army. And it takes people like Epaphroditus, ordinary people, for God to do the great extraordinary things he's doing around the world. I want you to go back to verse 29 so I can include. Uh, Paul writes, Welcome Epaphroditus in the Lord's love and with great joy and give him the honor that people like him deserve. In other words, we need to honor people who have fervently, fearlessly, faithfully served the Lord by serving others. Today I want to do that. How many of you have ever served in the children's ministry in uptown or downtown in the children's ministry? If you've ever served Children's ministry, lift up your hand. Let me see. Uh, just stand up right where you are. Just stand up right where you are and stay standing. If you've ever served in the church. I mean, when I see a man stand up who served in, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, that's a mighty man of God right there. You served in the children's ministry. How many of you ever served in the youth ministry? Would you stand up? If I ever served, keep standing, keep standing. Just and serve in the youth ministry. How many of you have ever served as a greeter or an usher? Let me see. You just stand, would you stand up? If you've ever, keep standing, keep standing. If you ever served as a greeter or an usher. How many of you ever stood, served as a life group leader? Let me see your hand. How many of you ever served as a leader of a prayer team or something like that? You certainly stand up. I want you to stand up. How many of you ever served as a musician or a vocalist on stage? Would you stand up? Stand up as well. How many of you ever served on the soundboard or with the lights and, or one of the technology people? Would you stand up? Now, let me tell you. Look at these people who are standing. They deserve our honor. They deserve our appreciation. Go ahead and give them a round of applause because Paul said, honor people that serve the Lord faithfully and fervently. And by the way, by the way, if you're not standing, if you didn't stand, you need to get plugged in and get involved and start serving because one day you won't just not be, just be honored by people here on earth. You're going to be honored by our Heavenly Father up in heaven. You'll have the privilege of hearing him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you rule over the many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And one last thing I want to point out to you today. Timothy and Epaphroditus and Paul were mightily used by the Lord because they were servants of the Lord and soldiers of the Lord because they cared about the personal welfare of others and the spiritual welfare of others, but also because they were sold out the whole route. To the Lord. 
Not 50%, not 75%. They were sold out the whole route for the Lord. Paul said it like this. I have been crucified with the Christ. In fact, would you read, would you put the, would you read this verse out loud with me? Let's read it out loud together, Galatians 2.20. Let's read it together. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself. That was Paul's commitment. But Timothy and Epaphroditus had the same commitment to the Lord. And God worked in their life. He worked through their lives in mighty and miraculous ways. And if you and I will become sold out the whole route, we'll see God do greater things in our lives than we've ever experienced. We'll see God do greater things in our lives than we've ever envisioned. Amen? You no, know, uh, one of my first cruises that Vicky and I went on, we went with a guy named Charles Stanley. Anybody ever heard of Charles Stanley? Now, I want to be guilty like Brian Williams of conflating. I never heard that word before. Conflating the situation. So I, I wasn't teaching with Charles Stanley. I was there re receiving the teaching, all right? And on that cruise with Charles Stanley, there was another guy, another pastor. His name was Stephen Olford. I'd never heard of Stephen Olford. Man, there was just a, a great anointing upon his life, and, and God was really speaking through him to me, and it really challenged me and encouraged me and helped me in my walk back in those times. And so I went back and I did some research on this guy named Stephen Ofer. Here's what I learned. He actually grew up the son of missionary parents in Africa. I mean, he saw God do some mighty things with his missionary parents. But when he was a young man, he went away to England, to Great Britain, and you know how it is when you're a young man and you're away from home and you're away from the family and you're, you, 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 some of you shaking your head. You know what I'm talking about right there. And Stephen Olford got involved in all those things. He became a race car driver. He, he was the party life, the night life. He was all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, he was diagnosed with a critical illness. He was placed in a hospital and told he only had three, he only had a short time to live. In the midst of his hospital stint, he received a letter from his missionary father back in Africa. Now, in those days, there wasn't the internet. In those days, they didn't have cell phones. And you couldn't call from country to country. You wrote. And sometimes it took a month or two months or three months for a letter to get from Africa. But he was in the hospital, and a letter arrived written sometime before by his missionary father. And here's what his father said to him. His father said, Stephen, I sense in my spirit. That you're not walking with the Lord like you should be walking with the Lord. That things are not right with you and God. He said, I want to remind you, Stephen, and listen to these words. All of life will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. All of life will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Stephen Olford said those words just buried themselves deep into his spirit. And somehow, way, in his weakened condition, he was able to push himself to the edge of that hospital bed. And he fell on his knees beside that bed. He prayed this prayer, short prayer, simple prayer. Here's what he prayed. Lord, anytime, any place, in any way, I belong to you. And three days later, that terminally ill man walked out of the hospital a healed man and became a great minister of the gospel. Here's what I'm telling you. When you're willing to get sold out the whole route for the Lord, when you're willing to say, Lord, anytime, anywhere, in any way, I'm yours. I belong to you. And whatever you want to do in my life, for my life, and through my life, that's what I want. That's what Timothy wanted. That's what Epaphroditus wanted. That's what Paul wanted. That's what Stephen Offord wanted. That's what Dennis Watson was. That's what Manny Miller was. That's what, that's what every single person is. And when we get to that place, when we say, Lord, anytime, anywhere, in any way, we're going to see God do greater things in and through our lives than we've ever experienced or ever envisioned in our lives. Amen? Tell the person beside you, you need to become like Timothy. Go ahead and tell them. And then tell them, you need to become like Epaphroditus and see how they say that name. All right. Would you bow your head with me right now? Heads are bowed.
such an honor and privilege for me to be here with you today. I'm going to ask our leaders who are here to come and stand at the front. They're coming to pray for people. You know, by the way, I said this to Javier earlier. Mardi Gras Sunday is the lowest attended Sunday of the year. And the only people who show up in church, in any church, are those who love the Lord. I want to commend you for being here on Mardi Gras Sunday. Even though some of you are still tired from the parade last night. Thank you for coming. Our heads are bowed. People are coming forward to pray with people. You know what I know? That even as we talk about serving the Lord and being sold out the whole route, I know that many of you have great struggles, great issues, and great challenges in your life. Our heads are bowed. Some of you are struggling physically. You have a physical illness or injury, or somebody near and dear to you has a physical illness or injury. Some of you are struggling emotionally. Maybe you're discouraged. Maybe you're struggling with fear like Timothy did. Maybe you're struggling with hurt in some kind of way or loneliness. Some of you here today have financial issues that seemingly are overwhelming. Some of you have strife and conflict in a relationship that you're involved in. Some of you have vocational issues. You've got problems on the job or with the job or you're in need of a job. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed and no one looking around. But if you would say, Pastor Dennis, that's me. I've got, I want to serve God, but I've got great challenges and struggles and problems in my life. If that's you, lift up your hand. Come on, tell the truth. Lift up your hand right now. Lift up your hand. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to come right now. We want to pray with you, and we want to pray for you. You say, why do I need to come? Because the Bible says, when any two agree touching anything, it shall be done in a person's life. If you'll come, we'll pray with you. We'll agree with you. We'll ask the God of heaven to unleash his power, his provision, his help in your life or in the life of someone you're praying for. Whatever the struggle, whatever the stronghold, whatever the problem, whatever the need, whatever the issue, you come right now. Don't wait. You come right now.